of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. They experienced one of the things that is associated with footprints, which is disappointment. However, they did not experience rest. They left heel marks in the sand, not footprints. What this lets us know is that rest is not automatic. Footprints are not automatic. So it will not be true of everyone who goes through life that they'll look back on their life and see one set of footprints during difficult times. Some will enter God's rest, and what it indicates here is that some didn't. They had the opportunity, but something was wrong. They had disappointments, but they didn't have the second thing that you need in order to experience footprints, which is belief. Belief. It's possible to go through disappointments, but not experience God's rest, not see one set of footprints because of disbelief. That's what it seems to say. Not everyone who experiences disappointing circumstances experiences God's footprint. Not everyone can see footprints. There will be those who will see heel marks. The when of footprints, disappointment, and belief. Heel marks result from disbelieving God's promises. Again, look what it says. Let's read that verse one more time. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. God made promises to them. He said, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be set apart for special treatment. He gave them good news. So they had promises. Then they experienced disappointments. They experienced water experiences where it was clear that God was with them. But then they experienced hunger and thirst. They, and that's part of what you need to experience to experience footprints. But what happened, they didn't believe God's promises. Faced with the choice of believing what they saw and believing what God said, they chose the former. See, the, sometimes when we go through life and we look around at what we're experiencing, it feels like we're abandoned, that we're left and forsaken. That's what we will do if we live by sight. Now, what God did, He told them, I will not leave you or forsake you. If you obey me, I will remain with you. But they got in places where they looked around and it says, I don't see you here. I see disappointing things. I see me not being able to have what I want to have. I see me not being able to do what I want to do. And then they believed what they saw rather than what He said. And they said, you must have abandoned us. And that's when the disappointments led to discouragement. And they said, and that's when if you look at their tracks, you don't see heel marks. You, you, you see heel marks in the sand. They said, I'm not going to follow you anymore. Why? Because you're not with us. Because you're not giving me what I want. You're not enabling me to do what I want. Heel marks result from disbelieving his promises. See, it's not just about knowing what God wants you to do. That's important. It's important to know God's commands. But they didn't leave heel marks because they didn't know His commands. Right? It wasn't about commands. It was about promises. They didn't, they didn't experience rest because they didn't believe the promises. Do you know His promises? Do you think about them? I know you think about His commands. How about His promises? It seems to indicate promise is the secret to rest. It's the thing that we need to know. And when we believe them, it ushers in an experience of rest where we feel carried, we are supported by Him. Believing His promises, well, footprints result from believing His promises. Look what it says in Hebrews 4.3. Now we who have believed enter that rest. I don't think it could be much simpler. So, what do I need to do to experience God's support in a more tangible way? I can't 
base my faith on what I see. I base it on what he said. I've got to know his promises. That's what's true of me, and it's true of you as well. What do you need to do to move from here to there in your spiritual life? It's about promises. It's about knowing and believing promises in spite of what's happening around you and me. We who have believed enter that rest. You hear what it's saying? The Bible doesn't stutter. There's sometimes it says things so clearly and specifically and succinctly. And it's doing that here. What do I need to do to experience rest? Now we who have believed enter that rest. That's what I want you to go out here at least pondering. What do I need to do to have an experience of God that I experience footprints? Believe His promises. God teaches His children to live by faith, to base their confidence on what He says rather than on what they see, especially as it relates to promises. God will teach all of us to base our faith on what He says rather than what we see. There will come times where what He says, the promises, and what we see, our circumstances, clash. It will be very natural for us to focus on what we see and to say, Hey, wait! You know, you, you said you'd be with me. And he said, I did say I'd be with you. And I am with you. But why don't I have what I want to have? Why don't I do what I want you to do? Because I will teach you to live by faith. To base your confidence on what I say rather than on what you see. When we look around, we see trouble in the family. It feels like we're abandoned. We see trouble at work. It feels like we're alone. There are things that are happening that are difficult in our life. We say, where did you go? We experience emotional problems, physical problems. We say, I thought you said. And at that point, we're pulled in two different directions. Basing our faith on what we see will lead us to feel like we've been abandoned, which will lead to heel marks. Basing our confidence on what he says will lead to experiencing rest and experiencing footprints. God teaches us to live by faith. This is the when. So, the when of footprints is during disappointments and when belief is added. Okay. See, we can't tie this up now, though. Now what we have to talk about is how. How do we do footprints, then? How can we do belief when the circumstances of our life aren't what we would want? Are we supposed to just try not to want things? That doesn't work. That's why we, if we, unless we deal with how, What I've said so far is really difficult to apply. Let's let's talk about that. The how of footprints. Number one, stand on God's promises. Stand on God's promises. Disappointments add up and promote discouragement. When we feel discouraged, it's not possible for us to stay in a good frame of mind. What happens? If our desires are frustrated for a period of time, now we could deal with one disappointment or two disappointments. When they add up, you throw a couple big ones in or a bunch of small ones, something starts to happen inside. We find ourselves beginning to crave, craving. If you want something and have wanted it for a while, I don't care if it's secular or sacred, when you want something for a while and don't get it, you really start to want it. Craving. And when craving goes on a while, what ends up happening is we end up getting angry. And we end up getting angry at ourselves. If I wasn't such a one, two, three, I would have what I want. Or we get angry at others. It's not my fault, it's her fault, it's his fault, it's their fault. What we can know is when We are telling ourselves we're idiots or calling other people idiots when we're really angry and contemptuous. What you can point to back, it's really really about that we didn't get what we wanted. We didn't get what we wanted. That's, That's where everything begins. And craving leads to contempt, leads to conflict. It would be nice if just... Singing a worship song, memorizing a Bible verse, 
trying to forget the things that we want and can't have. Just trying to forget them. Trying to kind of put them in someplace so that they don't bother us. It would be nice if that worked. I haven't found, now maybe you have, and I'm not being facetious. I'm not, I'm not playing around. I can't make that work. When I try to think about God, and, and I can do it for a little while, but you know what I find about my craving? It doesn't stay buried long. You experience that? I can forget what I want for a little while, but then, here it comes. I see somebody who has something I want, and I don't want to notice it, but I do. I, I head and I try not to think about what I want, but then the thought comes to mind. I don't think we can control our thoughts. That's why I, th- I, I don't. I, I think it's it's just difficult, and, and it's it's not enough just to try to brush over God's stuff. God judges our heart. And God's had this thing with the Israelites. They were really good at singing. Now, singing's great. Worship is great. It's vital. I'll suggest it's not enough. It's not enough just to think happy thoughts about God. It doesn't work. Because God doesn't listen to this. He listens to this. And here's what he said about the Israelites. Yeah, you honor me with your lips. You say all the right words. You say all the right things. You honor me with your lips, but I'm not listening to your lips. I'm listening to your heart, and your heart is far from me. What I find when my heart is far from God, when I feel distant from Him, it's because there's something that I really wanted and I didn't get, and I'm angry with Him. Now, I'm not always conscious of this, but I'm singing the words, but inside I'm singing, Oh, yeah, sure. Prism, 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 prism. You know, it's that grumbling underneath. Of course, I think I'm the only one that does this. I'm glad to hear some smattering of laughter. I think we all do. I think you do. Some of us get angry at ourselves. We take it out on ourselves. Some of us take it out on others. But it's really all directed back to not being able to get what we want. Stand on God's promises. Um, Call it coveting. I think, look what it says. James 1, 12 through 17. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, the word there, evil desire, is really covetous desire. That's really the word. When by his own evil, covetous desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire, coveting, has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. These individuals are saying, okay, I am tired of this, and they were. The Hebrews that James is writing to became Christians a couple years after Jesus passed on. You remember that 3,000 were added to the church, and they were all Jews. They became Jewish Christians. And life in Jerusalem was pretty good. People were selling their land. There was a community. They experienced this connection that was fairly, really significant. And as I've said before, there were a couple of famines, a couple of persecutions. They didn't stay there. They were pushed out into surrounding communities where they were bereft of, lost their neighborhood and their livelihood. And that might have been okay for one or two years, but then little Seth and little Rachel are growing up, and they can't get good jobs. And they don't have the friends that that a mom and dad would like them to have. So when James writes, it's like 15 years ago that they were in Jerusalem. And now they have been living in these places where they're half-breeds. And they are tired. And when James writes, they're saying, why are you doing this to us? What, why? We, we gave our lives to Jesus. 
We experienced all this difficult stuff. Now, you're supposed to give us what it is we need, but we can't get good jobs. I, I, we still don't have any retirement benefits. When we left the synagogue, we left our retirement benefit behind. I'm facing a very uncertain future. Why are you tempting us? And what James says, that's not the way to approach it. What James tells them, call it coveting. Now, listen to me. This doesn't seem to be real comforting. It, it's, it feels something like having an experience where you're depressed. You know, you're depressed about something and it's really going difficult. You go to talk to some person who gives spiritual advice and they make you feel guilty. And so you go in with one burden, depression, you come out with two burdens, depression and guilt. Is that what he's doing? Why would James tell us to call it coveting? And what he says is this. You're pointing your finger everywhere. You're pointing it at God. And you're pointing it at people. You're pointing it at neighbors. And you're saying, you're the reason why I don't have what I want. And you're the reason. And, and you know what James says? Look at most of your fingers. When you point, where do most of your fingers point? He says it's an inside issue. It's when your own covetous desires, you're dragged away and enticed. It's like fishing. I didn't do a good job fishing this past week. I tried. Caught nothing. Didn't even get a nibble. But I tried. I put a lure on it. And I, I put the lure and it. You know, you try to do this. And you try to do it in a way that it's enticing to try to get a fish to clamp onto it. And that's when the Bible talks about it's what our desires do. They try to catch us and, and pull us into this mindset. Call it covenant. Jesus reintroduced covenant. Um, up until that time, it had pretty much been swept under the rug. It, the, for the Jews, there had been nine commandments. But there are ten. Covenant. I look, every New Testament writer, now James writing the book of James, is different from Peter writing, First Peter, is different from Paul's writing, is different from what Jesus had to say. But the one thing the New Testament writers are unanimous about, they all talk about the impact of covenant. They say it wages war against the soul. So in order to deal with what we have to deal with to experience footprints, we have to deal with coveting. Coveting veils the light of God's smile. If you walk away with anything, I get a lot of mileage out of this. There are things that make me feel far from God. And what I've come to see, it's when I don't get what I want. And that's really what it's about. And I get angry at it. And I don't want to get angry. It's just what happens. See, I think it's a natural thing. Coveting veils the light of God's smile. And here's, so here's what I'm going to tell you. To the degree we learn to recognize and deal with our coveting. I want you to listen to me. To the degree we recognize and deal with our coveting. I'm not saying just yours, I'm saying mine. To the degree we recognize and deal with our coveting we will experience God's love in a deeper way. To the degree you learn to deal with your covenant and I learn to deal with my covenant, it will open up a deeper experience of knowing his love, experiencing footprints in the sand. What it says, do not love the world or anything in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And it seems to create a contrast. The love of the world, the love of the Father. And then it talks about, okay, what's the love of the world? Well, look what it says. For everything in the world, the cravings or covetings, same word, of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father but from the world. Here's what it's saying. That it's... The thing that causes the love of God not to be in us, that not that it's not there, but that we don't sense it, we don't experience it. It's not substantial. It feels light and wispy and airy. It feels like, oh, that's doing nothing. 
don't tell me about the love of God. It doesn't help me deal with what I need to deal with. What it's saying, if it's not getting down deep, it's because we are so captivated by what we see and wanting what we see and being irritated because we don't have it, is that God's love becomes veiled. Veiled by the fabric of our coveting. Jesus came to free us from being enslaved to our desires. James encouraged us to deal with the root of the problem. Now you say, is it covenanting or is it not? You know, we could try to figure it out. Literally in the Bible, covenanting is an earnest desire. And it doesn't have to be about bad things. In the wilderness, the biggest problem the Israelites had was that they craved food. Food. And the problem was the manna was the same. It didn't titillate their taste buds. And that became the source of their coveting. It doesn't need to be a bad thing. You might say, well, I can control. You know what? The Bible would indicate that we're all going to deal with it. You remember when coveting was born? In the Garden of Eden. Coveting was born in a perfect world in a sinless heart. Are you going to deal with coveting? Is your world perfect? Is your heart perfect? Even if it was, you'd still deal with coveting. See, some people want to get it away. No, I don't covet. I covet and so do you. Let's recognize it and learn to deal with it. That's what he seems to indicate. Deal with the root of the problem. Call it covenant. And then carry it to God. Call it coveting and then carry it to God. Look at the last couple lines of James 1. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And what we're to do with our coveting is to carry it to God. We're not to try to fix it or control it. We are to hold it and bring it up into God's presence. There are things that we want that are legitimate. That are things that are okay to want. Some have family issues. And it's okay to want someone in the family to have a different experience. It might be a child. It might be a mother. It might be a father. Is it okay to you want your father to be in a better spot? Is it okay to you want your mother to be in a better spot? Is it okay if you have a child and they're going through difficulties? Is it okay to want something better for them? Yeah, of course it is. Is it okay to want something better at work? Yeah, of course it is. And is it okay to move towards making correction in your son's behavior? Is that okay? Of course it is. Just don't do it first. Don't do it first. Connection, then correction. Connection, then correction. See, there are things that you're going to have to do, but what I'd recommend is this. Start this way. Deal with you and God first. Then deal with you and your son. Do you understand what I'm saying? Deal with you and God first. Then deal with your job. Deal with you and God first. Then deal with your mom. Deal with you and God first. Then your dad. What does it look like to deal with God? God, I'm disappointed. But I'm not abandoned. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me. Connection. Connection. That's where it starts. When connection comes first, it causes us to be able to approach correction from a quiet heart. It's much different trying to correct things with a quiet heart than correct them with a loud heart. So it might look like this. Some of you, if you have children and you're very concerned and you're going to need to make some decisions about what to do, you're going to need to try to correct some situations. Should you think about that? Absolutely. Just don't think about it first. 
I would suggest this. God, I'm disappointed. I always thought about being a father, a mother, who would be able to bring the child to a place where they would be this type of... And it's not happening. I'm disappointed. I don't see the things I want to see. I don't hear things that I want to hear. But even though I'm disappointed, I'm not abandoned. You have not left or forsaken me. I just need to base my confidence on what you say rather than what you see. And you say you'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm disappointed, but not abandoned. You say you'll never leave me or forsake me. Now you're not alone. Now your heart's quiet. Er. Now, think about, God, what can I do? But now you're talking to your Father. You're not trying to get this God to change your life so that you can be quiet. God says, I'm not going to change your circumstances to make you quiet. I'm going to teach you to base your faith on what I say, not on what you see. So come to me first. Connection, then correction. Then think about, God, what can I say? What can I do? Help me, God. Know your heart. Quiet your heart. Then share your heart with God and with your child. I think people know. Children, mothers, dads, people at work, they know when they're being approached by somebody with a quiet heart and somebody with a loud heart. People know when they're being approached when we're trying to force somebody to change so that we can feel better, feel quieter. Carry it to God. Living by faith does not enable us to get what we want. Um, You hear this, it's not true. Living by faith will not enable you to get what you want. Again, there will be disappointments. Living by faith does enable us to not get what we want. And to be quiet. Living by faith, based on my confidence on what he says, rather than what I see, enables us to endure not being able to get what we want. Claim his promises. For standing with God, call it covered and carry it to God. Claim his promises. God, I'm disappointed, but I'm not abandoned. You promise that you will never leave me or forsake me. If you stuck something away in your head, this would be a good thing to stick into your head. It can cover everything. Work? God, I'm disappointed at work, but I'm not abandoned. You will never leave me or forsake me, even at work. At home? God, I'm disappointed, but I'm not abandoned. You will never leave me or forsake me. I can't think of a place where that's not true. It's true everywhere. And it might not change everything, but it promotes a sense of quiet and belief. And what we found, belief leads to footprints. Enter God's rest. And then stand by the door. What it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather heal. What it says, when we enter God's rest, we are not to go way inside God's rest, sit down and say, ah, this is the life. Wonderful. I'm at rest. I'm at peace. Don't bother me. Don't disturb me. Don't call me. I'm at rest. I have what I want. Don't touch anything. Don't breathe. It's not what it's about. It says, rest, we're to make level paths for feet, and the feet are not our own. See, there's other people wandering around. And we are to experience rest and be close enough, not only to hold God, but to reach out to somebody else that needs to rest as well. That's what we're supposed to do. It's not about us. And what you'll find as you know your heart and the coveting inside as you quiet your heart connect with him then share your heart with God and with others and then give your heart you'll find it quiets your covenant you feel released we're supposed to get involved with people so enter God's rest but don't go in too far 
Don't go in too far that you can't serve people because that's not the place where you'll be able to sustain your rest. Again, we talk about serving. See, serving is not about the people you serve. It's about you. We need to serve. I included... I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'm going to read through this with you. I stand by the door. Sam Shoemaker belonged to the Oxford group, and it's the spiritual group from which Alcoholics Anonymous was built. Sam Shoemaker knew the founders, at least one of them, of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to read this. Could you follow along with me? And then immediately following the worship team will, will lead us in a song. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There is no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside and they as much as I crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only the wall where the door ought to be. They creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched, groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing that there must be a door, yet they never find it, so I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find that door, the door to God. The most important thing that any man can do is to take hold of one of those blind, groping hands and put it on the latch, the latch that only clicks and open to the man's own touch. Men die outside that door, as starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter, die for want of that which is within their grasp. They live on the other side of it because they have not found it. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find it and open it and walk in and find him. So I stand by the door. Go in, great saints. Go all the way in. Go way down into the cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics. It is a vast, roomy house, this house where God is. Go into the deepest of hidden casements of withdrawal, of silence, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those inner rooms and know the depths and heights of God and call outside to the rest of us how wonderful it is. Sometimes I take a deeper look in sometimes venturing a little farther, but my place seems closer to the opening, so I stand by the door. There is another reason why I stand there. Some people get part way in and become afraid, lest God and the zeal of his house devour them. For God is so very great and asks all of us, and these people feel a cosmic claustrophobia and want to get out. Let me out, they cry. And the people way inside only terrify them more. Somebody must be by the door to tell them that they are spoiled for the old life. They have seen too much. One taste of God and nothing but God will do anymore. Someone, somebody must be watching for the frightened who seek to sneak out just where they came in to tell them how much better it is inside. The people too far in do not see how near these are to leaving, preoccupied with the wonder of it all. Somebody must watch for those who have entered the door but would like to run away, so for them too I stand by the door. I admire the people who go way in, but I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in. Then they would be able to help the people who have not yet even found the door, or the people who want to run away from God. You can go in too deeply and stay in too long and forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know he is there, but not so far from men as to not hear them and remember that they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, but more important for me, one of them, two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch. So I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I had rather be a doorkeeper. So I stand by the door. We'd like to invite you. Father, I want to thank you for telling us the truth. It's difficult to be spirits tabernacling, living in bodies. We end up wanting things, and it's not that we are not to want them, but it's that those wants 
come to the place where they consume us and they blind us to your care. We say, if you really cared, you'd give me, and, and we try to step down on them, but that doesn't work. I pray that you'd help us to respond to our desires, not to react to them, to hold them and to hold on to your love at the same time, to call it what you call it. It's not about them. It's inside. We're going to deal with what happens inside us, and you would have us carry it to you, and you would teach us to live by faith and to base our confidence on what you say, not on what we see. You would have us learn to say, I'm disappointed, but I'm not abandoned. You will never leave me or forsake me. There's a serenity that comes from that. And I pray that you teach us more about that. In Jesus' name, amen.